Hello there, I'm Sarah and tonight I'm reading you my first ever published story. This was published with Effervescent in 2016 and it's called Not Made to Rest. I'm an actress baby, and actresses don't come with storm warnings, she whispers in my ear, leaning forward like she's telling me the best secret the universe has to offer. Her lips shine under the harsh spotlights, light reflecting off glossy pink. She's leaning so close I can see the tiny flecks sparkling in her lip gloss, fresh despite the smoky atmosphere. So she's a gloss girl, pink and light and sweet, sweetly high maintenance. Pale blonde hair glows pink under the lights, glitter sparkling in her eyes with the reflection of the swaying lights. We dance. She teaches me how to get the bartender to mix a drink, custom for you. Slides a note across the bar before I can see the denomination and pulls me away by the hand. Calls it the Harley and doesn't say why. Let me help you get a cab, she insists, while bowing mock gallantly and holding the door. To someone like her, it would be uninteresting to ask when I'll see her again, or worse, if. I get in alone, slouch back in my seats and close my eyes even as I know she's waiting. I don't see her again until I do. She's curled up outside the door to my studio, clasping coffee in a bag with the logo of my favourite bakery. She ambles lazily to her feet, as if the open door is all the invite she needs, but now it's been offered, she isn't sure she wants it. We eat silently, idly, over fast cooling coffee, and think about how pastries look best. She's dainty. A thin bracelet looped around her fine ring wrist and behind her players' hands. I'm reminded of her comment about storm warnings, and I can't picture her creating any kind of storm. She looks up from the pastry that's now mangled, lying shredded on the plate, and curls her mouth around a smile, but looks out of place on someone so fresh-faced. Want to see a storm tonight? She offers, and for a moment I wonder if I've spoken aloud. No. It's reflexive, abrupt, startles even me, and I set my foam coffee cup back on its table, sunless. She looks a little disappointed, then swings her legs off the couch and gathers the bag she dumped on the ground when she sat. She's so familiar, despite it being the second time we ever met. I've never had a visitor act so familiar in my apartment, never had someone bring coffee and make themselves at home. She kisses my cheek when she leaves, brushing the scent of coffee and cinnamon and vanilla over me, and slipping out the door. Something about her is cat-like, I think, as I brush off her lip gloss and clean up the remains of the food. I still don't know her name, it occurs to me, and I suspect she doesn't know mine, either. I don't sleep that night, too wide awake and too absorbed in watching for a storm that never comes. She has piqued my curiosity now. So when she shows up at the door a week later, bearing two pizzas, I invite her in. As she closes the door, I, stop, I spot a duffel bag, and she tracks my gaze to it, looking embarrassed for the first time since I've met her. This is when I understand what she meant when she promised, I'm an actress. The bag is overstuffed, stray tubes of makeup spilling out and clothes stuffed in haphazardly. I can't make sense of any individual item, but I sit on the bed and watch as she shakes out a dozen pieces of clothing, costume pieces that no one would ever wear in their day-to-day -day life. These clothes are meant for treating the stage. Oh darling, don't you know? The world is our stage. We are all performers. And she clasps my hands in her own icy ones, stares green eyes into mine, begging me to understand. I do. I get it. I tell her. Too quickly. She seems relieved and drops my hands, turns her attention to binding the dresser with perfume bottles and countless lotions and potions. The table space spills, looks like home, and she sprays two different perfumes, leaves them to mingle in the air, tucks her hand into the crook of my arm. Buy me dinner? She implores, and it's not in me to refuse. She's a whirlwind, all right, first moving in uninvited and unwarned, and then making my space her own. We eat at her choice of restaurant, 
though she takes precisely nine minutes overviewing me. I always take nine minutes deciding what to eat, and the staff are hovering with more than a little irritation. At last we order, and there's a hint of mischief to her smile, danger simmering a little in her eyes. So, how about a story tonight? She asks, and now she's the one looking impatient. I feel I know the correct answer. Yes, but the mood stops in my throat. She shakes her head, purses her lips, and stabs a piece of bread with her fork. That's the first time I've seen her mood so much as leave tranquil, but it's back. Thirty minutes, one dessert, and two cups of coffee later. I can feel the caffeine making its way through my veins. I wonder if her second espresso is having a similar effect. It'll be a while before I crash, so I'll only order another just to be sociable. That night, when we get home, we play classical music and dance, wildly clattering around the tiny space and knocking things over. It's dawn before I stagger into bed, burying myself below the duvet in hopes of sleep coming faster. She gets up two hours later. I hear her clashing around in the kitchen as if my few utensils are instruments. Sometimes I get the sense that she is creating some kind of melody. There's breakfast on the table, a stack of French toast and various fruits I didn't even know I had. She's bouncing between the table and the stove, glittering with wild energy. Today her lip colour is a muted pink lipstick. Sometimes I think I have learned to read her just by her choice in lipstick. She talks a little fast when she sees me. I had to go to the market, apologise for invading your space, so I made breakfast and coffee. Let's go to the beach this afternoon and sleep some more this morning. I sit quietly as she chats about the beach and how she'll pin up dresses over my curtains to shut out more light so I can sleep this morning. Going back to bed, it's easy to crash. There's something nagging at me, but before I can think about it, I'm already under the covers, my eyes closing. Sleep is not peaceful tonight, even after drinking peppermint and chamomile tea. Then again, it never does shut down dreams. True to her word, she hooks coat hangers with dresses and billowy long skirts over her curtains, shutting out just a little more light. The soft skirts don't suit her. They should be sharp-fitting pencil skirts, the better to sketch her imagination into real life. She doesn't suit real life. She suits fairy tales and myth, being a creature from the dark, one who walks in shadows and steals something you never knew you need. I awake to her piano music, drifting through the room, and when did I get a piano? There's no space for it, is my first thought. My second is that there is coffee brewing, properly brewing. I really break into the stash of good coffee, trying to keep my costs down where I can. A cup of good coffee is what happens after work, not before it. She's there, dancing around the kitchen. As far as I can tell, the piano isn't creating any kind of rhythm. The music rises and falls, crashes and crescendos with every few heartbeats. It's nothing that I've ever heard, and the look in her eyes is electricity bright. There's a storm today. I hear it as clearly as if she has spoken words, but her lips are still, and today I know her voice better than any. Know the inflection she places on storm as if she's speaking of a lover. The way she brushes over unimportant words and presses to the moonlight. Gravitas, she told me once, staring at paintings of storm-tossed seas, is the most important. Most important what? I never asked. I move around her, lightening and quickening my steps so we are nearly dancing with each other. She plays, dancing, dipping backwards on one foot, holding her arms out in an empty embrace. Her hair skims the tile of the kitchen, and I pour her another jumbo coffee draining the pot and setting a fresh one to boil. We drink, rich and plain and not troubled with sweeteners, not troubling ourselves to count. We need to save it for the storm. She drives to the beach, parks at the cliff tops. It'll take too long to wind down the long, narrow road, driving 30 miles an hour and hoping for it to stay dry. Mid-afternoon feels like grey evening. It's already darkening and she waves me away after parking. In my peripheral vision, I see her moving around in the back seat before she clambers out, snags the hem of her dress on the lever under the skirt, and it's tears. 
silver white sequins scatter the starlight over the seas. The sky darkens and the air is chilly. We stand on the cliff, well back from the railing that stops us toppling over, and wait. Thunder rolls in first, lightning hitting the ocean and painting it silver. I can feel my heart thudding, taste the coffee still on my lips, and swallow anxiety, bitter and patient. She grasps my hand, turns to me, and I see in her posture that there's madness in her bones. Her eyes are wild tonight. She strips away the civil mask that she built with makeup and accessories. Tonight she isn't a temptress in a club telling you how the world works. She isn't the cute girl who brings you coffee, or the chilled out one who moves into your apartment unannounced and uninvited. Tonight she peers over the cliff top as far as she can without touching the metal fence, grabs my hand at the next flash of lightning, and shouts something I can't make out. There's a break in the fence. A set of battered wooden steps. Still with her hand in mine, she tugs me towards the railing, extends her arm behind her. We keep our hands linked as we clatter down the steps, drowned out by the thunder. Her heels are tall, strappy and spindly and horribly impractical, but sh still she wears them, kisses the red of her lips onto mine, and looks up at me through her lashes, coyly biting her lip. I climb onto the largest rock I find, and as I watch, she dances in the damp sand, kicks it all over the place. Draws a line in between dry and wet. She skips perilously close to the water, dips an ankle in, and I hear her yell about how the water's lovely. Energy crashes, and I see the brightness in her eyes, the moodiness in the set of her jaw. Her hands shake when she pulls me off the boulder, spins me around in an imitation of a waltz lightning dress flying out all around her. Beyond us, the ocean lights up white and rain begins, rendering our clothes ragged and pounding the ocean. I feel it more than anything else, how she's desperate to go to the ocean, but at the same time, there's still some piece of logic still left in her. Don't go to the ocean, I rule her. We are already there, I think. We sit, curl into each other and watch the ocean, She's still in her totteringly high heels, dress soaked and in my hand. Her manicure glitters with the lightning. As the moon rises, I make out silver forks of polish streaked over each nail. Different directions and the trifecta descends upon us, hail and thunder and lightning. We make our way back to the car, sleep in the reclined seats and wait till the sunset over the horizon. There's a basket on the back seat packed with non-perishables that make up our breakfast. Below us on the beach, the mini fort is in ruins, rocks and branches everywhere. My jeans are thick with damp sand, and her dress hangs from her shoulders in tatters. Tonight, she tells me, there's no storm. She pulls a telescope from the trunk, unfolds it, and presses her eye to it. What she's looking for, I don't know. There's another bag in the back of the car, but when I go to investigate, she swats my hand away. Wait till it's darker. We change out of our storm rags into new dresses. Tonight they are pale yellow and navy blue, scattered with stars and cloud dabbed white paints. Tonight she looks like sunshine. We share the telescope, sitting together as close as we can. She thinks she sees Mercury, but the lenses are shitty. Somewhere along the line, dust got into them, blurring things beyond recognition. In her soft yellow dress, she is mercurial, bones white under the moon and stars, matching the effect of the moon on the dress, bleached white. Her lips are red again, eyes stormy dark, and this time she paints my eyes with mascara, liner, shadows to match her own. We're stargazing. If we can't match, we have to coordinate, she says, whispers it like it's a secret, boldly like it's a story she just has to tell. She is mercurial and there's no rest to be had. We can't fuel up on coffee, so it's simple to stay awake, push our bodies to the limits of wakefulness. On the second day, we sleep in the car again, resting for the drive. This time I drive, her hands tapping white noise as we loop the pedal to speed up, or let the car drift along. For once, I don't allow myself to think of the sight this must make. Two storm-logged creatures in gowns, 
Last night's makeup still in place and eyes glassy. Sleep is real. The storm's over, she says when we arrive home. She takes the keys, dangles them with a raised eyebrow, slots them into the ignition and starts driving. I watch as she drives. It's the only time that she looks completely concerned with what she's doing. It's also the only time I've seen her look uncertain in the slightest. The caffeine is leaving my system now, wearing off from the cocktail of adrenaline and energy, and I'm about to crash. I don't know what she's up to, but she'll be back. A few hours later, she is back. More bags piled in the car, and she tosses me my key, slings the first of her bags over her shoulder, weary and weary. Sure you can stay, I decide, spur of the moment. Maybe living with her, I'll learn something. Sure, baby, I relax you.